college students this is the first video uh, for for test number three so um, it's going to be called summer 26 so everything starting from chapter 7 fossils and evolution will be on the third test fossils and evolution First of all, let me define what fossils are. Fossils are any evidence of past past life. Any evidence of past life that is preserved in rocks. There are two main types of fossils. Let's go over some of the very basics here. The two main for uh, two uh, by the way, a person who studies fossils it, he or she is called a paleontologist. A paleontologist is a, um, is a geologist who specializes in studying past life. It might be useful for you to remember that paleo means ancient. Ontology means life, so ancient life. A paleontology is the study of ancient life, mostly extinct species. 99.9% .9 of species that have appeared on the planet have become extinct, meaning that they no longer exist. So what what are the two kinds of fossils? We have body fossils and we have trace fossils. First thing you want to remember is that fossils are only found in sedimentary rocks. That's why I love sedimentary rocks, uh, because they have fossils in them. I go, you go fossil hunting, and, and search for them all around the great state of Tennessee. Ninety-nine percent of the rocks that are exposed at the surface of the earth in Tennessee are sedimentary. So it's this is fossil hunting country. Um, let me first show you some body fossils. There are some different ways in which. Body fossils are actual body parts. That means uh, bones for vertebrates, shells for invertebrates. For plants, it would be things like uh, bark, seeds, roots, things like that. But body fossils include the following types. They can form by mineral replacement. They can form by carbonization. They can form by forming um, molds and casts. Those are the four main ways in which fossils can uh, body fossils can form: mineral replacement, carbonization, molds, and casts. And then we'll talk about trace fossils. Trace fossils are indirect evidence of past life. They're not actual body parts, and I'll show you some of those. First, let's take a look at fossils that are formed by mineral replacement. This is probably the most common way to form a fossil. For example, you see these things here. And we talk about them more in historical geology. These are called ammonites. Ammonites are cephalopods. Let me, let me write that down for you. They're ammonites and they are a type of cephalopod. Cephalopod is a invertebrate let me show you what and you can find these in Tennessee if you look hard enough. They look like this. In the, seven, in the 17th century in England, they would find these things. And they didn't know what they were because we didn't know what fossils were yet. And they thought they were the devil's toenails. But here you can see this thing is a cephalopod. And what's it related to that's alive today, do you think? Squid and octopus. The squid, octopus, ammonites, they have tentacles, a very good eyesight, 
and they swim in the water. That's, let's take a look at this, um, why we call this a mineral replacement fossil again. So let's go back to our picture here. Mineral replacement is just what the name implies. is when the animal dies, for example, or the plant dies, or the fungus dies, all of the organic matter, all the living tissue, including the shell, is replaced by minerals. So when you pick up a fossil, you're not, you're not seeing, there's no DNA to be extracted from this. Every cell in that animal has been replaced by minerals like this tree trunk you can see the grain of the wood and it looks just like a tree trunk but every plant cell has been replaced by minerals such as quartz usually or a calcite so the first way to make a body fossil is mineral replacement and the second uh, most common way to make a, f a body fossil is called carbonization what's carbonization referred to it's real important especially for plants and insects but um, when the organism dies you know that all living things are made of carbon you're made of carbon I'm made of carbon Every, all 8 billion people on this planet are made of carbon Mosquitoes are made of carbon. Dogs are made of carbon. Um, fleas are made of carbon. Whale, any living things, the living thing is made of carbon. And when the thing dies, everything vaporizes away except for the carbon. It leaves just a carbon imprint in the rock. This is the second type of fossilization. And you can only see carbon is black. So it leaves a black film showing the imprint of the organism. That's the second way to make a body fossil. Third and fourth most common way to make a fossil is through molds and casts. Okay, I'm going to show you both of those here. This is a shell of a clam and this is what we call a mold that's when the animal or the plant dies and it just leaves an imprint of the animal or the plant's body in the rock when this mold gets filled with sediment you can make a cast see the difference between a mold and a cast if you forget about that on the next test, think about this. Have you ever made a candle before? Uh, candle makers, they have to make a mold first, and then they pour the wax into the mold to get the cast, which is the candle you purchase at the store. Here's two fossils here of a creature called a trilobite. Which of these is the mold, A or B? Is this a mold or is this a mold? This is a mold and this is the cast. So um, those are the four main ways in which we can make fossils. Next thing we're going to talk about is biological evolution. Biological evolution we cover in a lot more detail in historical geology. but we're just going to go over the basics here. First thing I'll tell you is that biological evolution means that species change. And if you have attributes, if an individual has attributes that allows for them to survive in the world that they live in, and you can attract the opposite sex, and you can produce fertile offspring, 
those favorable traits are passed on. Only the fittest survive. It doesn't mean that there's not a creator. People make political hay about what biological evolution means. Charles Darwin, the person who came up with this idea of evolution in the 1800s, would, if you take historical geology, we'll talk more about him. Very interesting man. He himself stated that the theory of evolution neither proves or disproves the existence of a creator. So that's, I'm going to stay out of the political part of this. I'll just tell you that I believe evolution occurs. And personally, as a, as a Christian, I believe that God could have created evolution because he wants it, he would want his creations to survive. Most Christians feel that way. It doesn't mean there's not a creator. It means species change. Now, what are what are species? And, and I'll tell you what. Um, evolution is the foundation of bi modern day biology and modern medicine. I am absolutely sure that evolution occurs. It just makes sense if you think about it. Um, if you have what it takes to survive, you pass on favorable traits on to the next generation. Only the fittest survive. So let's talk about what a species is first. Species. A species, like our species, Homo sapiens, that's the name of our species, Homo sapiens, is a group of organisms that can mate with the opposite sex and produce fertile offspring that can also mate and produce their own fertile offspring. That's just common sense if you think about it. Now we You cannot mate with a gorilla or a, chim, a chimpanzee, so we're of different species. But if you meet someone of the opposite sex anywhere in this world and they have sperm or egg which are fertile you can you can reproduce with them so you're of the same species notice that species are written with two words both in latin so latin is not a dead language we use it in biology and paleontology all the time the first word is capitalized in the species and the second one is in small caps so we always have the first one capitalized and the second one in small caps. And there's two words for a species, Homo sapiens, that's our species. The first word in cap capitalized is the genus of the species, G-E-N-U-S. So we belong to genus Homo. A dog is written like this, from a German shepherd to a Great Dane to a Chihuahua. What is the genus of a do for dogs? Canis, right? So, so species is a group of individuals who can meet the opposite sex under natural conditions. I should say under natural conditions and produce fertile offspring. Now the natural conditions part is very important because dogs can all mate with one another and produce fertile offspring. Even the Great Dane and the Chihuahua can uh, be artificially inseminated to make a hybrid. However, wolves are written like this, Canis lupus. I think that's wolves, or is that coyotes? Let me see. Canis. Yeah, Canis lupus is wolves. Okay, so wolves, do they belong to the same genus as dogs? Yes. 
They both belong to genus Canis, meaning that they're closely related, but they're not the same species. Think about it. Wolves and dogs can make hybrids, but usually those hybrids are sterile. Number two, dogs and wolves will not mate under natural conditions. Under natural conditions, a wolf will kill a dog. Only if you raise a dog and a wolf together um, behind a fence and and you force them so that they have no other choice of another mate can they mate. But they're not of the same species because they will not mate under natural conditions. So what Charles Darwin says is that species will change because um, some individuals will have advantages over others and those advantages will lead to a higher chance of survival and therefore they'll get passed on to the next generation. I'll give you a few examples of how this works but let's um, first look at something like giraffes. Giraffes um, why do the giraffes have long necks? Well, in the past, in the deep past, you had giraffes with shorter necks and longer necks. You had giraffes that were much shorter and then those with much longer necks and then medium-sized necks. Let's say there were, uh, and this is what happened in the past, that there was a drought, and there was a very there wasn't many leaves uh, available for giraffes to eat, and the leaves were high up on the trees. Which giraffes are going to starve to death? Those with the shorter necks. If you don't have a longer neck, you don't have what it takes to survive. That's that's how giraffes have evolved to have longer necks. Um, and it has to do with all species. If you have, why do rhinoceros have big horns? Think about why does a rhinoceros have a big horn? Well, what is the horn used for? It's used just like with big horn sheep. The males will, will fight and get, try to get access to females. If you got a little tiny horn, if you got a little horn, are you going to get any? That's not the right way to say it. You're not anyway. If you got a big horn, you have a high, an advantage not only in during rutting season where you have to get access to females, but in protecting yourself from predators. Aren't you going to have a higher chance of survival? It's always good to have some humor in classes. I hope you don't mind. But uh, um, I'll show you how why I'm sure evolution occurs. Okay. In the 1800s, there was a type of moth. Half of them were black and half of them were white. Everything was the same about them except for their coloration. And it was about 50-50. You know what happened in England in the 1850s to 1890s. That's when the Industrial Revolution occurred. And in England, they burn lots of coal. When you go to London, Manchester, Southampton, throughout England, you'll see these big chimneys. They burn lots of coal. Their buildings were covered with this dark soot. After everything got covered up with a dark soot, which moths do you think would stand out on the buildings and get eaten by birds? The white moths, right? So the dark coloration gave the dark moths an advantage, and now those moths are almost always dark moths. It shows you how another, if you still don't believe in evolution, think about this. Um, DDT used to be kill, used to kill mosquitoes. It was 99% effective in killing mosquitoes. If you have a million mosquitoes and 990,000 of them will be killed by the DDT, who's going to survive? Those mosquitoes who have an immunity, the DDT survive, right? And now most mosquitoes will not get killed by DDT. Evolution works 
in the laboratory, uh, we see um, diseases evolve. So that our antibiotics no longer work. So the bacteria develop an immunity to our antibiotics. We have to develop new ones. So species change so that favorable attributes are passed on to the next generation. When we talk about body fossils, here's a body of a creature called a trilobite. Here you can see its eyes. These are its legs. They lived during the Paleozoic era and it was formed by mineral replacement. So that's not actual body tissue, it's minerals that have replaced the cells. Two conditions are 99% of the time, 99.9% uh, of the time, two conditions are required to form a fossil. One is the creatures must have hard body parts. Two, is it must be buried rapidly by something like a landslide. Bur it must be buried quickly. Why? Well, what, think about what happens to roadkill. If there's an animal that dies along the side of a road, and it's gross, but think about it. Um, the animal dies. And we come back a couple weeks later, what does that corpse look like? That started to decompose. The, those big black birds start to pick on it. Other animals start to scavenge on it, eating the soft body tissue. It starts to smell. Where does that smell come from? It comes from the bacteria that's eating into the decomposing corpse. You come back a couple weeks later, what's left? Just bones. The soft body tissue is gone. Flies will lay their eggs in the decomp decomposing corpse and maggots will eat in, into the flesh so that there's nothing left except for the hard body parts. In nature, soft body tissue is almost never preserved. But what happens to the bones over time? They get eaten. My dog out there, who I'm going to have to feed here after this film, is loves a bone. If I give her a dog, she'll be happy the rest of the day. So in order to preserve those hard body parts, those hard body parts have to be buried by a landslide so that nothing can get at them. If they're deeply buried quickly, there's no oxygen down there. Bacteria cannot eat into the flesh. Scavengers can't get at it. So the two requirements to form hard body parts, uh, to form a body fossil, are hard body parts and rapid burial. Soft body tissue sometimes does get preserved under unusual circumstances, such as in amber. Amber is tr ancient tree sap, and you'll see insects get caught in amber quite often. The other, the, the other rare circumstance were some other rare circumstances where you can preserve soft body tissue is by freezing. Uh, woolly mammoths died out a long time ago. Last one died out maybe 9,000 years ago. But our ancestors ate them, and we could find some. This is a baby woolly mammoth that was found preserved with its soft body tissue still preserved. That means we can take out its DNA and probably clone it someday, but that's another story. So you can also preserve soft body tissue through freezing. And you can also produce, uh, you can also preserve soft body tissue through tar pits. There are these tar pits that animals will fall into, and they get preserved. These are tar pits. Animals will fall into the tar pits and get preserved. But most, 99.9% .9 of the time, to make a body fossil, you need two things, hard body parts and rapid burial. Let me ask you a question to see if you understand this. Do you think that we have a good fossil record for worms? Do you think we understand the evolution of worms well? 
No. Because worms are almost never preserved in the rock record because they have no hard body parts. Okay, I, all the stratigraphic correlation stuff, I'm not going to talk about it because that's in historical geology and we have to move on. Here's the geologic time scale. You should know that. We talked about it earlier on. But look at it again. There might be a question or two on that on the next test. Eons, eras, periods, and epochs. We won't go over that again uh, because we need to move on to the next chapter, which is chapter number eight. And that, I'm going to start chapter eight in the next video.